too many sermons that start that way. <laughs> but the confession is that as I read the readings this week, and I try to pay attention to what sticks in my mind, what has some energy about it for me personally, and the person with the question and then with some more energy about it. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I was reading for track one. <laughs> but when I got here, I found out that you have track two, and so the lesson from Samuel, first Samuel, um, is not one that we read today. But that's what my sermon is about, so I would like to read that passage. <laughs> it's not too long. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Benina, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, that's the other wife, used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, and arose and presented herself to the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was just deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants. No razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant you the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to the porters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, she named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked of him for the Lord, from the Lord. The phrase that caught me is a little farther in that passage. The phrase is, this is but the beginning of the birth pains. That was in one of the other readings. This is the beginning of the birth pains. So you've got Hannah over here wishing she had a baby, and then you've got the phrase in this other reading that this is the beginning of the birth pangs. Well, I have to tell you, I used to be a Lamas teacher. <laughs> so I know a little bit about the beginning of the birth pangs. And many of you here, I'm sure, know something about that from experience. But what an interesting way to end the gospel reading today. And what a way to begin a sermon. This is but the ending, beginning of the birth pangs. What do we take that to mean? It could be said in dread. Oh, this is the beginning of the birth pains. As in, oh no, my contractions have started and I have no idea how long this labor is going to be and I'm afraid it will be hours from now before the baby's delivered and I don't know how hard the contractions are going to be but they seem pretty hard to me already. That would be the one set in dread. Mm -hmm. Or it could mean, oh great. This is just the beginning of the birth pains. We're going to get that baby. No worry. 
I'm unprepared. My suitcase is already in the car and the hospital's only a mile away. I could probably stay here at home with you, darling, and play cards for a few hours before I really get to see you. <laughs> <laughs> this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. So is that a warning or an encouragement or a cheer? It's the beginning of something anyway. Some kind of change is coming. And if you've ever had birth pangs, you know that it, you don't know what this transition is going to entail. Our first our reading from the Old Testament, the one I just read, says there are no birth pangs yet for Hannah. Hannah, Elkanah, her husband, and the other wife and the children are on their yearly pilgrimage to worship at Shiloh, where the priest Eli and his son serve as priests. Devout but childless, Hannah has prayed deeply and often for the Lord to give her a male child. She has been miserable, having no child of her own and being taunted severely and regularly by her husband's other wife, who has presented Elkanah with multiple children. Hannah is so upset at Shiloh that she won't even eat her portion of the food Elkanah has sacrificed to God. When today's story begins, Hannah feels very pointedly her barrenness, her powerlessness, her seeming worthlessness compared to her rival, even though her husband Elkanah encourages her to trust his love. The other wife's children seem like a miraculous gift to the family, but Hannah has had no children. And so Hannah begs God in prayer to remember her. She pours out her soul to God all her anguish and her dependency, her sense of uselessness in a culture that defines women's worth by their fertility. She groans her prayer of utter vulnerability and dependence on God. And she grieves and meditates and murmurs with her whole self, her body, all the cultural baggage and broken dreams, audacious hope, all of that is in there in her prayer and her grief. She prays for a son, promising God that she will dedicate his life to be a Nazarite. That's one who is sworn not to drink wine or grape juice or any fermented drink, nor to even eat grapes, the skin of the seeds. He was, would not cut his hair and avoid contact with the dead. A Nazarite vow is something that is undertaken voluntarily as a separation from others and a consecration to God usually for a specific length of time, although Hannah says it will be for his life long. Hannah's desperate prayer was, in a sense, the beginning of her birth pangs, her commitment to start down the road to new life, not only for a child, but for herself and her husband, Elkanah. So she does get pregnant. And after Samuel was born, Hannah brought her son, Samuel, back to Shiloh to be dedicated to the Lord's service. He did become a Nazarite and served there and was taught there under the tutelage of Samuel, the priest. The Lord's later appearance to the boy at Shiloh and the boy's establishment as a prophet there shows us just how central he became to the religious history of early Israel. Surely Hannah's desperate prayer is, in time, answered with the beginnings of birth pains. Those birth pains will herald a radical change in her life, in Elkanah's life, even in the life of Israel, as it turns out. Her prayer leads her from feeling like an outcast to a graced existence. With that human mix of who we are all called to be, a life filled with miracle and surprise and pain and promise, a life that changes us into who we shall become. The beginning gift of grace to Hannah grows into her son's full establishment in Israel as a prophet of God. God will determine Israel's future and Samuel will be an, will be an agent of God alternative in Israel to the house of Eli, for Samuel's birth will bring into the possibility of a new Israel, 
a nation that can look forward to being a people that not only suffers from the historical and moral limitations of all human society, but that also looks forward to what God's transforming initiative is going to make possible for them, even through all their historical and moral limitations, God will bring Israel to a moment of becoming who they need to be. Samuel in time will become a prophet and priest and an agent of God's sovereign initiative. We need to notice that God begins Israel's transformation in this crisis, not with great men and great events, but with the distress of a barren woman. And this was but the beginnings of Israel's birth pains. The bottom line for us, I think, in this story is that whatever crisis or failure or barrenness overshadows our lives, and we all have those things, we can trust that in God's hand our crises are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Not just the beginnings of difficulty, but the beginnings of something new that will be born into our life. Is at least it's my experience that our crises are the doors to possibilities which God can turn from pain to joy, in which God can use the wars and rumors of wars to strip away our complacency so we can realize that our rulers who have claimed to be God's gift to humankind aren't. And that talent, we discover the barrenness of our lives that we have thought were abundant. These two may be but the beginnings of the birth pangs, a new life that only God can bless, healings that only God can manifest, except the, one, the ones that God can imagine, new vistas that only God can prepare us to see, new challenges for which only God can strengthen us. These are the new lives that those birth pangs can be delivered to us by God through those birth pains and beyond the beginning of them and to their fulfillment. So my prayer is today that we may know those unknown times with the confidence of Jesus who says, do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. As a letter to the Hebrew advises us, may we provoke one another to love and good deeds, encouraging one another and all the more when our birth pain begins. Amen. Amen.